Oh, you need the mic. Oh, is that the mic? Okay. So we would like to welcome everyone to events and topics in renewable energy and the environment hosted by IPS and Park. Our speaker today is Dr. Xing Yang Lu. Xing Yang Lu is a professor of computer science and engineering at Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri. Professor Lu is editor in chief of ACM Transactions on Sensor Network. He's also the area er um, editor of IEEE Internet of Things Journal and the associate editor of Real Time Systems. He also serves as the program chair of premier uh, conferences such as IEEE Real Time Systems Symposium, ACM IEEE International Conference on Cyber physical systems, and the ACM Conference on Embedded Network Sensor Systems. Professor Liu is the author and co-author of over 100 research papers. He received his PhD degree from the University of Virginia in 2001, his MS degree from Chinese Academy of Sciences, and his BS degree from the University of Sciences and Technology of China and all his degrees are in computer science. His research interests include real-time systems, wireless sensor networks, and the cyber physical systems. Please join us in welcoming Professor Xing English. Thanks, and thanks everyone for coming. So I'll talk about smart buildings with wireless sensor networks. So, of course, we care very much about buildings, right, from the perspective of sustainability. Buildings are energy hogs. They consume 40% of the energy in this country and emit about 39% of the CO2 emissions in this country. So, so basically what we are going to talk about is this, this increasing trend of using wireless sensor networks to connect power meters, connect sensors, connect appliances with the Internet so as to intelligently monitor and control these systems right, to save energy while maintaining comfort and other convenience. Right? So this is a picture that I borrowed from AT&T, where basically it it's illustrates this exact vision, where you see all these wireless sensors right, connected to, to various appliances. And here is a real-time energy monitor. You can be at home. It's like a tab tablet. You can see a real-time power usage, and you can control various things. Right? And the smart homes is going to control your energy usage. Right? For example, it can control the HVAC system and other appliances based on your occupancy. When you're not home, it's not going to turn on the HVAC systems. It's going to pre-schedule it so that it's going to turn on before you come home. And it can provide finer grain control depending on which rooms you are in. It's going to turn on the air conditioning at those rooms and not the others. It can be integrated with renewable energy in the electricity generators, for example, uh, if it's a really sunny day, right, it's going to encourage you to feel free to use appliances as much as you can. On the other hand, it's a rainy day, you're not getting as much of renewable energy, it's going to try to encourage you to you know, deny certain you know, electricity usage and, and try to reduce it right, so as to minimize the energy you draw from the actual power grid. Right? So it's also important to note that the, um, the Smart homes are today an integral component of the smart grid, right? So there's all these ideas about, so that's why they draw this smart meter here, right? The smart meter is generally connected with the data centers of the utility companies so that they can communicate in real time, right? This is a brand new capability that smart grid is proposing. Um, so the idea is if the power grid is under stress, right? So you're, you're not, you're, you're not able to provide as much electricity as the peak demand requires. So what you do is you ch change the price of electricity on the fly right, at, at minutes level. Right? So these new pricing would be sent over to the smart meter over the, the internet. Right? Then the meter would communicate and control with these smart appliances. Right? So basically, if the electricity price goes up, right, maybe you know, um, air conditioner temperature setting will go up a little bit, right, so that you, you're drawing less energy to maintain the stability of the power grid, right? On the other hand, right, when there's not much demand on the electricity, then the price will go down, then it's going to encourage more usage 
from these appliances. And this problem become much bigger when you know big things like electric cars go a lot. Actually, people estimated every electric car's electricity usage equals an entire house. Right? So imagine you double the number of houses in this country like, within five years. All right. So uh, actually, there is this video, right? So if I this could work, I would play it. So so um, this is to show that some fairly significant trials of such smart grid systems combined with smart homes is already happening, right? So this is a video from IBM. The notion of the smart grid is using what we have, uh, making do with what we've got, and not build so much new infrastructure. Software as a gateway between generation and transmission can solve that problem. The smart grid is basically a bunch of smart devices connected over a network to a bunch of computers, and computers crunch all this data and then are able to optimize the system. What we're working on is helping utilities see what's actually happening in real time in terms of the flow of electricity between all those devices. Benefits the consumers, benefits the environment, all because of things we can now see that we couldn't see before. On the Olympic Peninsula, Peter Hill's goal was to make the smart grid tangible. We were taking home area networks as a way of sending messages to the homes and to the devices in the homes about when they should run or not run. There was one other modem here that captured wirelessly the reports from the different elements. We say the approximately during this time, 15% of our electric bill. We can do that for everybody in the country. We're talking about saving $100 billion worth of infrastructure that we won't need to build. IBM has been the first big company to really see the opportunity to marry information technology with the grid. There are several things going on in South America, Asia, in Europe, we've been working with Malta to make both the water and electricity systems much more efficient. It is a model for how we can then bring that to other larger geographic areas. The path forward to smart grid is actually quite clear. We upgrade our telecommunications networks, our satellite networks, and we can do the exact same thing with the smart grid. The wind plant will go up and down by the minute. The solar plant will go up and down as clouds go over. So having a grid that can flex itself and manage these, these kinds of things is critical. We need to be planning for the kind of future that we say we want, which is an era of cheap, reliable, clean electricity for decades to come. You try to get back to the slides. <laughs> Here we go. All right. So, 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 wireless sensor networks enable these technologies within homes, right? They connect the appliances, the power meters, and the controls within a home, right? So, what is wireless sensor networks, right? So, this is happened about a decade ago when people realized, you know, our technology has reached a point where you can integrate real microprocessors and sensors and radio in a tiny package, and then you can manufacture such systems in massive scale economically. Right? So this is actually an example of a, something that, that the Berkeley called smart dust. It's a single chip implementation that integrate, integrate everything that mentioned there. Right? So think about you take, take these little you know, chips, right? essentially embed it with all kinds of different sensors and turn them into wireless you know, devices instantaneously, and they will also be smart devices because they actually have microprocessors in it, right? Um, so just let me show you, so this is, so this is slightly, you know, futuristic in a sense, it works very well in a lab, it's not really in a massive quantity on the, on the market yet, but this is something that's readily available today, and I have like hundreds of them in my lab right, right now, right? So, uh, so this is, where we can take these embedded microprocessors. This is a very popular one from Texas Instruments. They run at four or eight megahertz, 
right, it's integrated with this standard radio chip, right, based on this IEEE standard 802.15.4, so that it can communicate with other devices wirelessly. It has its flash memory, it has this RAM, right, so it, it's, it really, you know, is a programmable smart device. Then you can embed this chip with various different kind of sensors. So in fact, I did bring a couple of gadgets here, right, so that I can show, show off to you. Right, these are things that we, we built. Um, no, actually, we didn't build them, but we have them in our lab. So this is um, the Acme deep, um, power meter. Right? It's a wireless sen uh, meter where, um, so you just plug it into your wall outlet, right? Then you plug your appliances on the other end. Then it's going to monitor the electricity usage of this appliance in real time. It can monitor your dishwasher, it can monitor your uh, air conditioner, and so on, right? So if you open this thing up, right, so it actually has this epic call in it, right? So it has the microprocessor, it has the radio chip, and, and all these I.O. interfaces that you can use. Um, so so we, this is one of the devices that Berkeley designed and, and we are using in our project. And what we do is we do software on these systems to have all kinds of smart functionalities in your system. And this one is something that we use as a micro server, right? So basically, uh, we're getting every apartment to plug this into their internet connection. And this is a, uh, if you follow gadgets world, this is a Raspberry Pi, right? So this costs $35 and, and it's an entire computer, right? So, uh, so this can be your micro server that collect, aggregate all these information right, from your various sensors and send them over the internet. It can also intelligently make local decisions, right? So I'll pop this around, right? So be a little careful when you open this up, if you want to, okay? But because from outside, it's just like any standard outlet, right? So the world has changed, right? Because we have these tiny computers and, 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 and low power radio chips. All right, so I'm going to give you three examples, right? So feel free to stop me and ask, ask questions. So these are three actual research projects that happens at WashU in my lab in collaboration with others, right, uh, in this area, smart homes uh, with wireless sensor networks, right? So first I'm going to just give you a fairly brief overview of what we do with how do you achieve reliable, low power wireless networking in homes, right, in order to connect these sensors. Of course, when you do this intelligent control, you must have a reliable sensor network, right, because otherwise you, you, you turn off your air conditioner during you know, the peak time, and then if you are not able to turn it back on, it wouldn't be a good situation, right, for example. Um, so you need to have reliable networks. And then I'm going to talk about two research projects that, that actually iCare is funded, right? The first is a smart auditorium in Brower Hall. That's the main auditorium in the basement of Brower, uh, where we heavily instrumented and, and try to understand the thermodynamics of this, you know, real world auditorium. Then I'm going to talk about the ongoing project. Uh, it's a, a smart home uh, in these quadrangle apartment buildings that's part of the green rehab project that you may, may have heard of. Okay. Right. So why do we use wireless for smart buildings? Right. So for, to start with, right, so this, this are really convenient. Right. It does not require any wiring, which can be very expensive right, and, cost, uh, uh, and require labor. Right. And so basically, if you turn all these things in wireless, right, for example, if it takes the Acme uh, wireless power meter I just showed, right, all, all it takes is to plug this into the wall outlet, then plug your appliance into it, and that's all it takes, right? Then, then plug your, um, your Raspberry Pi into the internet net connection, and, and boom, you have the system working and monitoring and controlling your systems uh, in real time. So, so, so it's very convenient, right? It does have some real world challenges too in terms of reliability. Because these uh, first these operate in this 2.4 gigahertz uh, band in terms of wireless spectrum usage, right? So these are exactly in the many other things that you have in your home. These are the same band with Wi-Fi. These are the same band with your game controllers. These are the same band with your baby monitors. And if you have one at home, right? So um, so it, it's a very crowded spectrum. And so actually, this this is a real measurement from six apartments plus my student's office in Bryan Hall. So, um, so it's a very busy spectrum. And at the same time, you know, by definition, these are low power you know, sensor networks, right? So it, it, it's a little brother, right, in terms of you know, competing for the airspace. 
and the zero may lose if you don't design it you know, a smart way. So, uh, so this shows uh, long-term measurement in terms of the spectrum usage, uh, the weighting, so this is from a spectrum, spectrum analyzer, uh, so this is the entire 2.4 gigahertz, gigahertz band, right, so the y-axis is the frequency of the signals, and then the y-axis is the amplitude of the signal, and the color represents the frequency you see a signal at this particular frequency with this particular amplitude. Right, so basically the hotter, the more frequent you see those signals. So these are really fascinating figures to look at. Right, so basically you look at these things are your Wi-Fi access points, right? That's your Wi-Fi access points, that's your neighbor's Wi-Fi access points. Right, so uh, you're in, in residential environment, you know, people don't, you don't have control over your neighbor's, you know, Wi-Fi access points. So people tend to put them on, you know, three different orthogonal, you know, uh, channels of Wi-Fi. As a result, of course, they, end up taking over, right, most of the spectrum that's available in the 2.4 gigahertz band. Remember the sensors have lower power than the Wi-Fi, so whenever they, they collide, the uh, wireless signals of the sensors will lose. And then there are also other things as a non-Wi-Fi, right, so which are, um, you know, these blue signals, right, so these can be Bluetooth, right? it can be other, you know, proprietary wireless communication devices, it's, it's, it's even more sort of a random behavior that has to deal with. It's kind of a pretty wild situation in real homes. Right? In contrast, if you're wondering what's happening with this one, so this is our Wi-Fi you know, wi wi network where all the access points apparently is set up at one same channel, which is great. So it's a well-managed, it, it may not be the most efficient right, in terms of uh, utilizing the entire spectrum, but it's perfect for wireless sensor networks. So by the way, this is my wireless sensor network test bed, which has 70 nodes in Bryan Hall and Jolly Hall. So, so, so for this kind of environment, it's well controlled, well managed. You can set up your wireless sensor network in your home, you know, in this building somewhere that avoid, you know, the only interference right, in these buildings versus in real residential environments, like in apartment buildings, it gets a lot messier, right, to play with. So certainly one of the research, I don't want to go into detail, but one of the research we have been doing is how to develop these robust, right, energy efficient wireless protocols, right? Because you don't want to have to replace all these batteries of now 100 sensors in your home once every week, right? So then nobody would use your system, so it's important to be both reliable and energy efficient. So then I'm going to go ahead and dive in to the Sprower Hall system right, that we developed. Right, a year ago. So, uh, of course, the overall, so this is a Brower Hall auditorium. It's a nice architecture hand drawing, right? So, basically, the idea is you want to reduce the energy usage, right, with, while maintaining comfort and air quality in the auditorium. And so, in order to do that, one thing that we really paid attention to is how do you understand the thermal dynamics of the, of the auditorium under the influence of HVAC system. Right, it actually has, this, this of course, Brower Hall is one of the new, our newer buildings with a state-of-the-art, right, commercial HVAC system. We'll see how that works, okay? So what we did is we put in a lot of sensors in this auditorium, it's really become our playground. Uh, it's, it's even better because there are real people using the auditorium, so it's, it's a real life test bed. And then what we end up getting is this large longitude study uh, with multimodal data set that's very valuable for understanding the energy efficiency issues in this you know, fairly uh, large space. And then taking these large data set, you know, we can model, for, among other things, the spatial dynamic, spatial temporal thermal dynamics of the auditorium, because if you have ever been into any of these large spaces, like the auditorium, you would know some spots it's really cold, some spots it's really hot, and it changes over time as well. Uh, so how do you understand that so that you can control your HVAC system at finer granularity and more efficiently and more comfortable? And then, of course, we go ahead and look at all these data sets and try to identify opportunities to save energy in this auditorium as well. So this is a wireless monitoring system. Right? So, uh, it so first of all, we put in a bunch of temperature and uh, humidity sensors. There are over 30, there are 30 sensors. Right, so they are all communicating over Bluetooth wirelessly to our base station, right? So then we also integrate our sensor data with the existing sensors, right? That's in the state-of-the-art HVAC system, 
right, uh, so, sold by Johnson's control. So they also have only a couple of temperature sensors, a couple of CO2 sensors, uh, and then uh, in addition, they have these operational data like the airflow of the HVAC system, uh, temperature of the setting of the HVAC system. So that goes to a particular database right, that Johnson's control maintains. So when the, then we also put in these surveillance camera data, right, so that we can actually tell the real occupancy right, of, the, of this room. Of course, as you can imagine, most of the time it's empty, but sometimes it do have a crowd in there for seminars and, and colloquium and so on. So you get occupancy data, which of course is important, right, to understand the efficiency and thermodynamics of such systems. We also put in particle sensors that turned that got turned into wireless as well. We essentially hacked it and connect Bluetooth interface to it. Uh, so that you know, join our uh, base station data set as well. So all these data get aggregated onto the internet, so that, uh, visualized and installed so that we can analyze and model the dynamics of such systems. Um, so in the end, right, we suspect we got the, what we made is the most instrumented auditorium in the world, right, potentially. Uh, it has 34 temperature sensors, 15 humidity sensors, uh, one condensation particle counter, so that's a, a proxy you know, uh, uh, for air quality in some ways. And then there are two CO2 sensors. And then uh, we also to try to correlate these phenomena with the HVAC operations in terms of airflow rate data, air temperature data. We can also correlate that with occupancy from the camera. Right? So, uh, so these database systems continuously you know, uh, generate and store data uh, on the internet. And so that we can analyze it, it also visualize it through web interfaces. So what we have got so far, right? Certainly, the first important outcome of this study is we got this large longitude multimodal data set um, that, that really very you know very few people have right, in the world. Right? So this is a real auditorium, large auditorium that we have mo start monitoring it since January, the end of January. So we have about eight months of data with all these different sensing modalities. And of course, the system is still working. So if you go to uh, the Brower Hall auditorium in the basement, nowadays you can still see our sensors all around. It, it, it's just uh, yielding you as, it, as, the, um, as the subjects <laughs> continuously uh, collect data. So, uh, so they're all contributing to the study whenever you go to that auditorium. Um, so it's fine grained and the multi-model, right? the temperature sensor would actually send a new reading to the base station every time it see a change of one third of a degree. And the humidity sensors right, would send a new reading every time it sees a change of 1% right, in, in uh, humidity. The particle counters can generate readings three times a, a second. So these are very unusually fine grained data that you get from these things. We do integrate the sensor data with the standard Johnson's control data from the HVAC system. That's a lot slower, but they do give you CO2 readings, airflow readings, and, and then combine that with occupancy data that we get from the, from the cameras. So, so these are very valuable assets right, to the research community, including eye cares and beyond. Right? If you ever want to understand how do you make a auditorium efficient, how do you make a large scale industrial HVAC system uh, more efficient. Okay. So, for example, this is the kind of data you might be looking at. Right? So, this is from a real you know, uh, data set right? during a week. Right? Certainly, you'll see there's, so these are diff various you know, temperature sensor data, right? Not the temperature. You can see there's strong differences, right? spatial variations right? between different sensors. Of course, the temperature also changes over time. So, it has you know, clear spatial temporal dynamics that you need to worry about if you want to design an efficient system. Um, so this is a particle counter, right? We see these uh, air qualities of the rooms do change, right? Depending on the events and the HVAC operations that's uh, going on in the auditorium. CO2 is usually used as a proxy for occupancy, right? You can see it indeed fluctuate depending on the events that's got held in the auditorium. This is a real ground truth data from the camera, the real occupancy. Right, as you can see, most of the time it's empty, but it does get used right, at varying degree. And then you can correlate these data with the airflow of the HVAC system, which essentially indicate how hard the HVAC system is working. Right? Sometimes it's, it's actually essentially in a sleep mode that usually happens at night. But the problem is you can see it operates in pretty regular intervals. 
right? So basically, the, right now, they, even though this is about the best HVAC system you can get, right, an industrial grade system, but they essentially operate on fixed schedule. It turns out, turns on at 6 a.m. every day, turns off at 6, 9 p.m. every day. So, uh, so then they generally operate at, at a pretty, pretty constant uh, airflow rate. Uh, occasionally, when there's really a the big crowd, like 80 people in that auditorium, that's when you see this is it's trying harder to, to do more ventilation into the space. Okay. So in terms of temperature and humidity sensors, right, so the, there are, as I said, 34 devices there. Some of the sensors have both temperature and humidity. Some of them only has temperature. Right? It's all over the space, the plate, and some, some of them are higher, some of them are lower to rep, in order to get a sense of what the air dynamics goes in that space. These are actually in collaboration with Emerson. So these are real commercial wireless thermostats that you can buy from Emerson. Right? So, but what we did with we, but, but this was never designed to monitor a space with 30 sensors in our space, right? It's really more you buy one, right, from, you know, for your house kind of scenario. It actually has the option that you can buy three, you know, for your house, and then you take an average reading of the three and try to control it. Um, so basically, we, we hacked it. <laughs> so, and so that now it become a distributed sensor network over Bluetooth uh, to get all these 34 sensors to work together. So it captures the fine grain dynamics. So this is how humidity changes in this room. Right, so it's kind of funny to look at these figures because you always get um, these um, impression that with all these commercial buildings, you get constant humidity, right? Because the idea of they, they take all this air from, from outside, combined, mixed up with the internal air, then it's actually really cool it down, right? To something like 50 degrees. And then the, the idea of cooling it down is it get all the waters out from, from the air. Right, so to dry it up, and then it releases the air into these different rooms. It, it turns out it's not true, right? And, you know, it's not exactly effective because it does still have a fairly high variation in the humidity you experience. Of course, you get much more complex dynamics with the temperature, the humidity changes less often right, uh, than the temperature. Okay, so temperature distribution. Right, so this is if you take the sensors at the at the uh, essentially the the seat level, right? So that's where a, uh, the you know pe people who are in that room would experience, right? The kind of temperature. So you can see there's pretty high variation. Uh, if you take a snapshot of the temperature, uh, actually the variation is as high as uh, two degrees, right? So <laughs> you are going to feel very differently right, depending on where you sit. Right? So this is a useful map, right? You, before you you can check that before you go into that auditorium. <laughs> so in general, it's a lot colder near the podium, right, in the front, and it's a lot hotter, right, in the back. So in fact, this is where some computer science comes into play, where you can do this standard thing called sensor clustering, sensor data clustering, right? So this is the uh, standard data mining technique where you can run these clustering algorithms to try to say, you know, what are the data have similar behavior and what are the data that, that really belongs to different groups. Right, so have pretty different behavior. So if you run the clustering, if you only do two clusters, it's actually fairly you know, uh, intuitive, right? So eventually the end result you get is that the, all the sensors in the back, it belongs to one group, and all the sensors uh, in the front essentially belongs to the other cluster. You get more fine-grained understanding of how they differ if you run more clusters, right? Which we have done, but I'm not showing here. But here's at least one problem you can see, right? So it's, it, so, so these auditorium do have two thermostats, right? Except both of the thermostats, one is here, the other one is here, <laughs> right? So you certainly are not helping out the, the, the people in the back, right? Because they, they are experiencing you know, much higher temperature. Uh, and um, so they would feel pretty, pretty hot. Uh, uh, and versus, let's see, are they going to feel pretty hot or pretty cold? I don't know, I, th I think these, Coloring has nothing to do with the temperature, so this is not the temperature gradient anymore, right? So it simply says this color is one cluster, this color is one or more cluster, right? So the people in the back would be quite warm, people in the front would be quite cold. It doesn't help when you pick, you decide to simply put your thermostat all both in the front and both sides symmetrical. <laughs> so then you would certainly not be able to control your HVAC system enough to make the people in the back comfortable, right? So then what you can do is you can actually do these um, computer science data mining algorithm. You take all these uh, time series data from these various sensors. 
So you run the clustering algorithm, right? For example, in a simple case, you run it with two clusters. You, in this case, it's fairly, you know, relatively intuitive, right? The back sensors is one cluster, the front sensors is the other cluster. Then you pick one sensor per cluster, right? Instead of like in the current practice where you pick two sensors in the front, which really belongs to the same cluster. So they wouldn't represent the, the differences, right? Between the different areas in the auditorium. If you take two sensors from the two different clusters, right? So if you run this uh, control technique called system identification, that you essentially try to come up with differential equations that capture the, how the temperature changes in these different clusters, as well as potentially how they correlate you know, with each other because there could be heat transfers between them, right? So this is a fairly sophisticated model, right? So it's, it's it taking into account, you know, whether the HVAC is working, right? What is the airflow? And then, you know, where are the occupants and whether the lighting is on, right? Because lighting actually generates a fair amount of heat load, then the ambient temperature from outside, and then you come up with this model, right? So um, based on the real data set to so the, drive the estimation of the parameters, so you basically end up a model something like this, right? Where the red lines are the real temperature changes over time, where the green lines are the actual simulations based on the model that we established based on the data set. Right? You can see you certainly capture the trend you know, much more precisely than before. Right? Now, what, what the important uh, importance of this kind of modeling work is now that serves as the enabler, the foundation for designing more fine-grained, smarter HVAC controls. Right. Without such models, you wouldn't be able to get it right. So, um, so we, as I mentioned, we also monitor the particle particles right, in this uh, in the auditorium. This is important, right? So, uh, obviously, any of these buildings have these codes that basically says, right? Of course, feel free to make this as energy efficient as you can, but make sure you don't make people sick, right? So you want to maintain sufficient ventilation so as to maintain the air quality. So the idea is to understand, so right now the rule of thumb is fairly simple. It basically says, if you take this room has N people, right, there is a certain ventilation airflow per capita, per capita, so every person has to get this much of airflow, then you basically multiply the two and then you get the total amount of ventilation that you have to do. Um, this is a fairly gross measure and fairly conservative measure, right? And it has no direct, you know, uh, monitoring of the air quality. So we figure if we understand how the air quality changes over time, maybe you can come up with more intelligent controls. So that's basically what we did. So we take this, you know, particle counter, right, from, uh, from ECE. So we basically, again, hack it and make it real time, we make it wireless, right, and add uh, Bluetooth chips to it. So now it joins our data set, right, over the wireless network, right? So, um, and this is something you'll see. It's actually a fairly fascinating thing to look at it, right? So um, basically what you see is certainly air quality has a lot to do with occupancy, right? So certainly whenever you have a seminar, you have a seminar, you have a seminar, you have a midterm exam, it depends on how many people there are, right? The, the, air quality, the, the particle counts go up, right? Because of human. Um, but then HVAC has a lot to do with it, right? So, so when HVAC turns on and off, it, it perturbs the air quality uh, uh, the particle count in the, in the auditorium as well. So food actually play a role, right? You serve pizza like, like what we are doing right now, right? The, the, this, this spike is particularly high, right? As well as coffee, apparently. So, um, so, so this, is a, this is a small start, right? So basically we are trying to get out as much data as we can so that we can understand you know, how, how the air quality changes so as to control the HVAC system more aggressively based on air quality monitoring. So finally, what we also try to look at is, you know, you know, based on these real world data, right? So what are the opportunities you can, you can save energy uh, from the, this monster, you know, HVAC system, right? So, um, so right now it's clearly, you know, operating on a, you know, suboptimal, you know, operation schedule, right? So it has a fixed schedule, right? It basically turns on, as I said, you know, every day at 6 a.m., turn it off at 9 p.m., right? So, and basically when it's on, it's on so-called occupied mode, it's really, you know, pumping out airflows fairly aggressively, right? When it's, you know, in the non-occupied mode, it's indeed, you know, at a lower level of operation, right? So, but of course the problem is, even though you're, you're, you're saying this thing has to be on between 6 a.m. and to 9 p.m. every day, 
right? Of course, 90% of the time the auditorium is empty. So nobody is using it, right? So uh, in fact, this is basically what you see is this, the blue lines are the occupancy, right? And, and the red lines are the fixed schedule where the, uh, uh, the HVAC system would be working pretty hard. Okay, so that's where you clearly uh, you are wasting quite a bit of energy, right? So one thing we realize is we go and check the EEC's calendar, <laughs> so that where they, they reserve the they use to reserve the auditorium, right? Clearly, so we, we can actually get these actual reservations that people make, right, uh, to, of these auditorium, and then we look at our camera data and and know the real occupancy. It turns out they you know the the EEC people are quite well behaved, right? So and so basically the uh, the calendar actually predicts the actual occupancy at 98% accuracy. So people do, you know, reserve the auditorium, then do go there, right? If they don't, if they, if they, and they don't go there without making the reservation. So it's fairly, um, so this is important, right? What this is important is you can, this means you can actually, all you need to do is to check the calendar, you know, that you can do that with a software, with a computer program, then schedule the operations of the HVAC system accordingly. And you would be, be right 98% of the time. Um, so then what you can do, right? Suppose you know the occupancy uh, pattern of, the, of this auditorium, what you can do, right? So, so you can schedule the HVAC system accordingly, right? It, so what you can do is, certainly you, you want to maintain confidence, comfort, right? You don't want people to, you know, uh, come into this room, it's all cold, and then, you know, the, the HVAC system turn on, and uh, you know, three hours later, they become, you know, get to the right temperature when people are all gone. Right, so you can't exactly do it too simplistically either, right? So you do want to maintain, you know, the comfort level that people are used to while saving energy, right? So this is basically why, why you need to do something called preconditioning, right? So basically you have to start the HVAC system, you know, you know, a period before people need to use that space, right? So this is, right, for example, if it, you need to take into account the time it needs to reach the desired temperature level, that people are used to you know, before, you know, when people come in, right? So unfortunately, that's one problem with these large scale, you know, industrial HVAC systems. It actually takes three hours to, to get from whatever temperature at night to the temperature that, that we're happy and feel comfortable with, okay? So which means, you know, before an event, suppose you have an event at 11 a.m., you have to start the HVAC system at 8 a.m., right? So it's clearly, if you can reduce this time TP, Right, you would be able to save a lot more energy. But you know, that's you know, based on the data traces, that's how it is for now, okay? Um, and then, of course, you can probably save a lot more energy by turning off the HVAC system early, right? So certainly what you can do is you can turn off the HVAC immediately after the last event every day, right? Because you know, okay, the last event is 2 p.m., there's no more events in this auditorium, go ahead and turn it off, right? So you get to save a lot of energy, right? Instead of turning it off at 9 p.m., Right, and of course, also by this definition, by this logic, HVAC would remain off, you know, throughout weekends, right? So, so basically the logic goes, you should turn off the HVAC whenever the next event will happen more than TP time, you know, in the future, right? So then you can save some energy by turning it off, then still have some sleep time before you have to turn it on again, right, in order to ramp up the whatever desired temperature that you want. Uh, you certainly want to avoid stretching because these are large machineries, right? You, you can't really afford to turn it off and turn it on, turn it off and turn it on, right? So you, you're probably going to destroy it. So what you do is you want to avoid stretching, right? Basically, you remain on if the next event is within this TP, right? Because then it, it, you, you, if you turn it off, you wouldn't be able to have enough time to ramp up back to the desired temperature, chances are, right? It maintains comfort, it reduces all these un unnecessary on and off that can be bad for these machines. So this is a, you know, the result based on actual data traces. So unfortunately, the facilities don't allow us to actually play with the real thing. <laughs> so, but yeah, at least we can, based on these data traces, do retrospective analysis and figure out how much energy we would have been able to save so that we can show up to the facilities, right? Um, so this is basically, so the dashed lines are the default fixed schedule. Right? Suppose you don't want to observe the default schedule, but rather for the simple strategy that I just talked about with preconditioning and with early turnoff and so on, right? So this would be something that you do, right? 
So for example, here's the case where you know that according to the calendar, there is an event coming up, right? You have to pre start preconditioning it by right, three hours before the event actually happens, right? So then uh, you can turn off the entire HVAC system right after the last event of the day because there's no more event that happens. Uh, this is a case where actually you have one event here, you have another event here, the gap between the two is less than three hours, right? Then you don't turn off the HVAC system at all, right? So then how much energy can you save? Right? If you look at the six weeks of data traces, right, you can already easily save 78% of the energy that's consumed by the HVAC. Right? So uh, most of, much of the energy is saved by turning off the HVAC immediately after the last event of the day. Okay? So that saves you 36% of the energy. Um, you can save 34% more by turning off the HVAC you know, during Saturday and Sunday because indeed nobody uses it right, according to the calendar and the real camera. And you don't actually save much energy by turning on the HVAC system light right in the morning. It's right? just simply because it takes you know as long as three hours to warm this thing up. You know, chances are you have an event that's early enough in the day to force the HVAC system to be turned on pretty early, pretty close to the 6 a.m. you know schedule, anyways. Okay. All right. So in summary, so this was the auditorium project that we did. Um, so we did this fairly fine-grained instrumentation of the auditorium that pretty, pretty much at unprecedented scale uh, and granularity. And we generate this large longitude multimodal data set that can be very valuable to anyone who wants to study you know, how to optimize HVAC systems uh, in this fairly complicated uh, real-world space. And then we take a crack at establishing these spatial temporal models of the temperature changes over time and space in this large, uh, in this large area. Right, so as to provide the foundation to design much more efficient uh, HVAC systems. And we also identify all these significant energy savings you can get right, if you just control these things based on occupancy. Right. So there's a lot of uh, exciting opportunities ahead. Right? So you can certainly, you know, now that you have an understanding of these models of the spatial temporal dynamics of the temperature, right, you can optimize the HVAC control. Right? As I said, certainly one of the main goals that we want to do is also to leverage air quality sensing for much more aggressive HVAC control, right? So that you don't waste energy when the air quality is fine. Now I'm going to switch gears to the ongoing effort that, that you know, it, it's actually still going on actually um, right now, right? It's the smart home in you know, apartment buildings, right? This is part of the green rehab projects, right? So uh, of course, as always, we're going to save energy without uh, while maintaining comfort. Right. But this project really is much more um, ambitious in a way than the audit auditorium project, right? So number one, it's closing the loop. So this time we're actually trying to control the appliances, right? We're doing it for real. Number two, it's human-centered, right? So uh, the one thing that uh, even architects acknowledge, right? You can do all these things with your, with your architecture design with the right walls and the right windows and the right appliances and so on. But it's the human activity that really play a central role in how much energy you actually consume. The people actually have done these studies where um, in Europe where they say, here is a super energy efficient building, right, according to architects, design, and then here is a traditional home that's really in no way is energy efficient. Right? Then they measure you know, which house actually consume more energy, the, the result is opposite, opposite. It turns out in one house is this lady who is really, really energy, you know, uh, you know, uh, cognizant, right? It would save every bit of energy, even though she is in a traditional home, she ends up saving much more energy than the other home, right? So, so there's this human activity that uh, really play a key role. So that's why what we are doing, right? So basically the system tries to incentivize residents to save energy right, over the uh, mobile phone interfaces, right? So, and this is something that we call the internet of things, right? This is the end-to-end -end system that integrate power meters, sensors, appliances, right, communicate with the cloud computing environment all the way in the Amazon EC2, and then, then, then feed back the information to a human uh, uh, over the smartphone interfaces. And as I said, this happens in the two of the buildings in, that owns and operated by Quadrangle with, with real residents, right, students. So this is a pretty complicated picture, but I just want to give you a bit of a sense of, you know, in the end, what we are trying to accomplish, right? So basically, the idea is um, you have all these, you know, power meters, you have these sensors that 
observe the duty cycles of the appliances as well as sort of environmental parameters like humidity and, and temperature, right? So you feed all these data into uh, the eventually to the cloud in the back end where, we, where the databases and the algorithms run. So where you can then try to estimate, you know, the occupant comfort level and the energy consumption prediction based on the temperature, based on the previous patterns, based on the climate, right? Uh, and then you have these intelligent algorithms that are based on game theory, that are based on control theory, that you design. You try to certainly control the appliances directly, but you also try to incentivize the human to save energy, to say, you know, um, today is a sunny day, go ahead and use a dishwasher versus <laughs> today is really, you know, we're not getting much of energy from the solar panels. Uh, if you use it now, you would end up drawing quite a bit of electricity from the, from the actual power grid. Right, so you would uh, you know waste money, but you would also be less green. Right, <laughs> there's a psychological pressure that's being applied there as well. So and, and then there's social network too, and try to compare you with your peers, and basically try to come up with strategies to encourage you to be green and save energy, uh, certainly without hurting your comfort level significantly. Right, so that that's overall that's that's what we are trying to do uh, in the end. And this is a close-up view of what the system, that as far as the computing and the wireless sensor network is concerned, what the system looks like. As I said, right, so you basically, this is your Raspberry Pi that you just saw, that right? you just plug it into your internet connection, your apartment. And then that's going to be up and running. It's going to have these multiple wireless interfaces, right, so that you can support uh, sensors from different vendors that run on different wireless technologies. Right? You would have these different power meters that you saw, like the Acme, but uh, others as well. Right, so that would be monitor the real-time energy usage of these different appliances. Right, it would be also be integrated with things like thermostat, right, so that you know the temperature and humidity, so that, that you have a comfort model of the residents. Of course, you also want to integrate with the weather st station, right, because that influences how much you know green energy, right, such as the solar panels and and wind turbines that you can get, right, from the renewable energy sources. Right, so then all these information get to the microserver, which is the Raspberry Pi in this case. Right, it's going to make some local decisions. Right, so then and then it may also send the data to the cloud computing backend, right, which then crunch on the numbers and come up with the intelligent strategies and feed back that information to the smartphones of the residents. Right, to first of all, you are going to see your real-time uh, electricity usage, you know, from different appliances. Right, because I have these smart puck, right? You know exactly how much energy you are burning because of dishwashing or versus because of washing or because, you know, shower and other things, right? Uh, and then, but also it's going to try to incentivize you. Essentially, it's going to try to give you advice right, with, with incentive to say, you know, I really think you should do this and that, right, with, with the following reason, right? Try to encourage people to be more energy efficient. So you need a reliable wireless connection. <laughs> All right. So, so this is what we're building. So you already saw them, right? So we're we're doing. Uh, so this is sort of the prototype one, right? So this is actually already uh, done, right? And and being tested in my lab right now. Once it's finished testing, it goes into these apartments. Uh, so this is Acme sensors, right? So it, it's it, it's this that you just saw, right? The Raspberry Pi as a, uh, as a micro server. Right, so we actually these data eventually get anonymized. That does go to Amazon EC2. Right, so that's if you don't know, that's a cloud computing uh, environment that you can pay Amazon at very cheap rate, and you get all these massive storage and computation that you can do in the cloud computing. So this is good because this is you know as a property owner, right, like what you are called jungles, you have all these different apartments in these different buildings, right, in different areas, because all these data goes to this cloud computing environment at Amazon. Right, so you you get to manage all these things you know, fairly conveniently. Right, you get also you know get correlate all these different data at a centralized cloud computing environment where the algorithm can operate. Right, so um, so that's basically the the first prototype we already have. Right, so the next step is to deploy these systems. Right, so there are two quadrangle green rehab buildings that we are currently targeting at. Right, so uh, these are basically at Westgate in a loop. And there's uh, six apartments in each building, two to three residents per apartment. And most residents 
these are students, uh, wonderful students, who have uh, most of them have signed up. So as we really appreciate you know, all these uh, participation and excitement from students. And stay tuned for our progress. Right? So this is happening right now, and, and hopefully we have more real results to report pretty soon. Right? So basically the idea is we're going to uh, take some of the apartments as the actual, you know, control, uh, actual you know, smart apartments, and then some of the others as a control, as a baseline for comparison, that we're going to basically see you know, how this influence human behavior and end up saving energy or not, right, compared to the baseline. Right. So in the end, I just want to uh, wrap up this by talking about some of the big picture vision stuff, especially from a uh, computing right, for system sustainability perspective. Right. So what you're really seeing is the smart homes are coming. Right. So actually, you, you can actually, even today, if you go to places like Lowe's and so on, you can buy so-called smart home systems. Right. So there's various systems that you can, you can buy. Right, so certainly some of them are power meters that try to help you save energy and display the real-time power usage. They really don't do as much intervention. And you can certainly buy a system where the music can follow you from room to room, wherever you go, the music is always playing, right? So that's continual, that's continual. You don't have to push a button if you change rooms. Um, there are security systems where you can set it up so that you let your guests in right, at certain hours right, without, you know, but while maintaining the security alarm for the rest of the time, right? This is all because you have wireless connectivity, connect with your cell phones, and then you have intelligence with the locks and other sensors as well. Uh, you can prevent bad things like carbon is down for too long, the carbon monoxide is too high, and so on. It's all connected with the internet and with your smartphones. So, so you can get all these things set up quite nicely and help you live a better life, right? And be more energy efficient. So as I said, these things are already here, right? You can already buy many of these systems today. The problem is the market is very fragmented. Right? So you can only buy these proprietary devices, they set up the particular app and software with these couple of sensors. It kind of really pull all these different sensors that do different things into a coherent integrated system that we call the Internet of Things. Right? So actually, by the way, this is a box that my student Rahab was doing this, is pulling out. It's, it's a real thing, you know, advertisement where you can buy today. Right? So, but, but you, you really cannot integrate them into a coherent system. So what we are doing, and our vision, is really to build this, something the so-called open Internet of Things computing platform, where, um, so it's going to support this ecosystem, right, it's with this, all these separation of concerns, right? It's going to have this platform where allow hardware vendors to sell sensors and the actuators, all the, and the sensors and actuators can be easily integrated into the system, right? Then it enables, you know, app developers that can easily program new intelligence, right, new policies and strategies to save energy and improve comfort, right, in the cloud computing environment, on the mobile phone, and in the microservice, right? So it's an automatic, just make it happen, you know, through this open architecture and application programming interfaces. And service providers will be able to offer managed services through standardized interfaces, and households can easily decide right, what service they want to enable and what policies they want to do. Right? So we're not there yet. We have all these pieces there. Right? So it's time to build up this, this, this Internet of Things architecture to make to glue all these things together nicely. All right, so I should thank, this is you know, a, a very large scale effort that thanks for the support from iCares and other places. Right? So this is the auditorium project was done with uh, Professor Pratim Biswas right, at ECE. Uh, the, uh, the Smart Home Project is currently ongoing with Professor Ayi Nahorai right, at ESE. So it has been wonderful collaborations with Emerson. Right? So Bill Drake is their sort of research manager there. And we have been having these wonderful collaborations in both projects. And all these students who actually did the real work. Right? And, uh, and th these are, of course, again, thanks iCares for the support as well as you know, industrial support from places like Emerson, Broadcom, as well as the National Science Foundation. All right, I'll stop here and uh, listen to questions. Thanks. Any questions, comments? Yep. Yeah, uh, thank you for, for the long talk. And uh, in, in, the, in the auditorium part, you said that uh, according to that, it totally shut it off when it is not useful. What I was thinking is, 
you don't have to totally shut it off. You can low, uh, put it in a lower uh, function level, like in your chart is 40 occupants, you can put it in to 20 occupants. So uh, the time uh, you need to reach the high level is shorter and uh, you save energy. That's right. That's right. Well, that, first of all, that is what they don't exactly just completely shut it off. There is a fairly low level of airflow going on even at night. Um, but then that exactly says, you know, that's why it's important to understand these complex spatial temporal dynamics of how the temperature and, and air quality goes, right, so that you can optimize the end-to-end -end process. So that certainly is a very good point, right? Yeah. But you have to understand the, 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 the dynamics of the system to do it right. Because uh, they, they leave it on for the emergency, uh, emergency use sometimes because uh, right. sometimes they need to use that in the real time or in a sort of schedule. So That's right. Leave it at a re relatively low uh, function level to be that. Right. Sense, right. Exactly. Right. But also, how low, right? And when do you start this? Right? This all depends on the dynamics. Uh, you talk about the Internet of Things. Uh, um, I, I'm thinking you probably mentioned some devices they have the proprietary protocol. Right. Uh, uh, why don't they use this TCP/IP? That all of them change to TCP/IP. Why, why do they design the I mean, proprietary protocol so that they don't talk to each other? Well. Um, well, that certainly is part of the problem, right? So first of all, they they do talk. Your different wireless protocols. Some of them talk Bluetooth, some of them talk Wi-Fi, and some of them talk the 802.15.4, right? So there's different wireless, so you have to have different wireless interfaces. Then there's this application level protocols. Even if they speak TCP IP, right? How do we interpret that their data, right? So I might put temperature ahead of humidity, I might take, right, so the different order and, uh, and different data type and so on. Right, so that's actually, by the way, is exactly some one of the element of this open Internet of Things platform that we are building is to allow you to express this metadata, right, in a generic way, so that if you are Emerson versus Honeywell, right, all you need to do is to fit, to have this particular, say, XML file that says this is my metadata, my data format, right? You you, you give that to the Raspberry Pi to the microserver, then everything is taken care of, right? That that. Dealing with heterogeneity is one of the challenges in this space. That's part of the reasons why we don't have the systems that talk to each other. Right? Yeah. Other questions? Yep. Yeah, thanks for my talk, Dr. Lu. Uh, my question is regarding the third project. Uh -huh. You mentioned this uh, concept of closed loop, right? Right. You know, with all these nice features of sensors, you know, the, the microservers and infrastructure, with right. this, you can collect the data. Right. So what's your waiting on the control? I mean, you know, if you think about it for a real department, usually, you know, for a month, it costs the uh, student, you know, 30 40 dollars. <laughs> I mean, how do you, right. right, what's your waiting on the control? I mean, interaction, you know, really attracts that attention. Right, so this is actually a very interesting problem. Uh, the, the incentives, right? Incentives design is in itself is a, is a, is a branch of science. Um, so indeed, there is actually this interesting talk at TED, right? Talking about where, how do you incentivize people to be more green, right? So it turns out, for example, money doesn't work, right? So they run these real experiments where you say, you know, I'm going to save you money if you are more green and save energy, uh, partly because the electricity is too cheap. Right, in this country, so that, that, that's one of the reasons. But then you know, people are just not that, all that sensitive to that. Okay? So it turns out one thing that turns out is about the only thing that worked really well is peer pressure in the sense of social networks, where uh, all it takes, it turns out one thing they found that really worked really well is to tell them that out of your neighborhood, you are the biggest energy waster. And that turns out to work really, really well. So, so indeed, so one of the incentives you can come up with is this, this social networks based you know, metrics where you understand how your peers are doing and try to incentivize you to be equally you know, green, almost. All right, that makes sense. Thank yeah, you. yeah. This is uh, this ground up behavioral psychology, actually. Yeah. 
All right. Thanks for listening.